I'm Melanie Sayward, and you are tuning in to The Pink Elephant. Hi there, and welcome to The Pink Elephant Podcast, where we talk about the most undiscussed issue in the body of Christ today, that despite all we know, it can feel like there is something missing in our faith. I have been procrastinating over this episode for some time because it is a mammoth topic and there is so much difference already in what Christian communities believe about it. But I've been trying to remind myself that my goal in this podcast is not to provide theological debate, even though naturally you can't not talk about theology when you talk about God. No, my goal has been to consider how the practice of our faith is aligning with what we believe. It's been all about depth. By going deeper in the word, deeper into what it means for our life, if we were truly convinced of the goodness of this gospel. Okay, that's probably enough prefacing, but the topic for the next two episodes, maybe even three, is the Holy Spirit. If you've listened to my story, you would know that I first attended a Presbyterian church, and then as a young adult, I attended a Pentecostal church and have largely attended Pentecostal churches since with the exception of a small stint in a Baptist church, which actually didn't stay Baptist for very long because the senior pastor decided to retire and the leadership of the church was actually handed over to another Pentecostal church. Anyway, I have also completed a non-denominational leadership program attended by leaders from Anglican churches, Salvation Army, Baptist, Uniting, et cetera, et cetera, and I've been studying a Master's of Divinity for the last four years through a Church of Christ Bible College. My point is I have always had an appreciation for the various denominations and I think there is much that we can learn from each other. I certainly don't presume that the denomination I am in is the right way, if you know what I mean. However, my tendency toward Pentecostal traditions really comes down to their slant on the Holy Spirit. Though I must say that even Pentecostal churches these days can be very un-Pentecostal and unspiritual. Growing up in a Hindu family has meant that I am familiar with the spiritual, and I'm sure you can imagine some spiritual experiences I've had were not very pleasant. I couldn't deny it even if I wanted to that the spiritual world exists. And of course, I've mentioned before many times my own experiences with dreams. The point is I believe in the Holy Spirit, and I believe the Holy Spirit is an active factor in the body of Christ today. And most denominations would agree with that statement. But of course, where we all tend to differ when it comes to the Holy Spirit is exactly what active means and looks like. So I'm going to delicately attempt to talk about a complicated topic, knowing full well that most traditions don't agree on how the Holy Spirit operates. Now, before I begin, I'm making some assumptions in this episode. I am making the assumption that the person listening to this episode is a follower of Jesus who has heard, learned, and understands something about the Holy Spirit. I'm making the assumption that you believe in the Trinity, which I know excludes some denominations, and I'm sorry for that. I'm not doing that deliberately. I just know that it would be really hard for me to deliver the perceptions and interpretations I have about the Holy Spirit without acknowledging that I make this presupposition whenever I attempt to understand the Holy Spirit. Also, I do interpret the Holy Spirit as a person, although I say this with less certainty because I realize that the Holy Spirit is mysterious and probably doesn't fit neatly into the little box that we would like it to fit into. But even if you don't agree with all my assumptions, I still think this episode could be really helpful. There is much that we can glean from scripture about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a regular and active participant throughout scripture from beginning to end. In Genesis 1, the Spirit was hovering over the face of the waters. In Genesis 40, Joseph is being shown the future through a dream revealed via the Spirit. In Samuel 1.10, the Holy Spirit comes upon Saul and he is compelled to prophesy. In Judges 6, the Holy Spirit comes upon Gideon to win a battle. In Judges 14, the Holy Spirit empowered Samson to tear apart a lion with his bare hands. 
In Isaiah 34, the spirit is described as gathering people. In Ezekiel 2 and 3, the spirit entered into Ezekiel and lifted him up and the spirit spoke and Ezekiel could hear him. Now, we haven't even gotten to the New Testament yet, and there's actually still so much more in the Old Testament that I just don't even have the time to mention. But I'll just mention one more because it is an important one. In Joel 2.28, we are promised that the Holy Spirit will pour out on all, sons, daughters, young and old, duh, will prophesy, have dreams and see visions. Then Jesus comes along and his conception is made possible by the Holy Spirit. Now, that, that's really big. I mean, we mention this a lot during Christmas time, but what a remarkable act for the Holy Spirit to perform. Then the Spirit descends on Jesus like a dove during his baptism. The Spirit leads Jesus into the desert to be tempted. Jesus casts out demons by the power of the Spirit. And, of course, he heals a lot of people. There's the centurion servant in Matthew 8, Peter's mother-in-law in Mark 1, a leper in Mark 1, a paralytic in Matthew 9, the woman with the issue of blood in Luke 8, the two blind men in Matthew 9, the man who couldn't speak, that was Matthew 9 too, the withered hand, Matthew 12, and of course he raised a few people from the dead, that's in Luke 7, Luke 8, and John 11. And then we get to the book of Acts, one of the most sensational books of the Bible in terms of its relaying of the Holy Spirit's traits and capabilities, which should all be very important to us. In Acts, we see the following, the first ever occasion of speaking in tongues, something that we have no evidence of occurring prior to the Pentecost. The Holy Spirit empowers people to speak and teach boldly, I might add, and sometimes in the face of persecution. This happens with Peter, Paul, Stephen. The Holy Spirit prompts thousands to accept Christ on several occasions. The Holy Spirit frees Paul and Silas from prison in a violent earthquake. There are frequent healings. The crippled beggar in chapter 3 and chapter 8 tells us that many who were paralyzed were healed, and there was a man with crippled feet in chapter 14. As Stephen is being stoned, the Holy Spirit allows him to gaze into the heavens and see the glory of God. Paul is filled with the Holy Spirit and the scales on his eyes that were causing him to be blind fall off. And it says in Acts 9 verse 31 that the Holy Spirit encouraged the growth of the church numerically. In Acts 16, the Holy Spirit prevented Paul and Silas from traveling into a particular land. And of course, there is the intimate guidance of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit spoke several times to Philip in chapter 8, instructing him to walk here and there. It even says after Philip baptizes the Ethiopian eunuch that the Holy Spirit snatched Philip away so that the eunuch never saw him again. I mean, how interesting is that one? And then Peter has a vision and the Holy Spirit verbally gives him the interpretation of that vision, which paves the way for a meeting with Cornelius, the first Gentile to convert and receive the Holy Spirit. And there were more visions, dreams, and other miraculous occurrences recorded in the book of Acts, which is only 28 chapters long. The Holy Spirit is capable of many things and is consistently present and active throughout Scripture. Now, here is my question, the million-dollar question. Why don't we see the Holy Spirit operating like this today? Don't get me wrong, we do see the Holy Spirit operating. He does guide us and, and people have visions and, of course, there are tongues, but there are significant gaps. Not everyone seems to experience the kind of guidance that we see in Scripture. And, of course, there's the healings. Yes, Healing does happen, but they aren't nearly as often as what we read in Scripture. How are we supposed to reconcile this when we read passages like Mark 16, verses 17 to 18, which says, And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up serpents with their hands. And if they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They will lay their hands on the sick and they will recover. There are some confronting ideas in this passage. 
based on what is said here, we should all expect that supernatural acts would surround us as we live out our faith. It's a natural byproduct of being a believer. Now, that's astounding. There's something missing, right? I mean, I have to be honest, this has been the biggest something missing topic for me in my Christian walk in the last 10 years. I read the scriptures and I see this massive gap between what we experience today versus what was experienced by the early church, and yet it is the same spirit. So why would the expression of the Holy Spirit change? Why would it be different today? Is the Holy Spirit limiting himself or are we limiting the Holy Spirit or both? I have prayed and wrestled with this conundrum for years. And so today I want to share with you what I think accounts for what is missing in the body of Christ when it comes to the Holy Spirit and how he operates. But first, a question. Is it possible to limit the Holy Spirit? And if so, why would the Holy Spirit be limited? There's this really interesting and short verse in 1 Thessalonians 5.19. It says, do not quench the Holy Spirit. Within the statement, Paul is implying that we are capable of doing things that would impact the expression of the Holy Spirit. In other words, if Paul is instructing the Thessalonians not to quench the Holy Spirit, The implication is that the Holy Spirit is quenchable by us. Okay, so in general, the Holy Spirit is not limited, right? If the Holy Spirit wanted to do something, anything, he could do it. He is not limited in his capabilities. But to a degree, he is limited in his ability to work within us and through us because that relies on our cooperation, Even Jesus was limited in his ability to perform miracles in his hometown because of the people's unbelief. Now, there is some discrepancy here between the version of this event in Mark 6 verse 5 and Matthew 13 verse 58. Mark says he could not do any miracles, whilst Matthew says he did not. Now, we know that there were plenty of things Jesus did that did not require the faith of others to occur. He often did heal because of someone's faith, but that doesn't necessarily suggest that he's dependent on others' faith in order to heal. I mean, I'm not really sure many of his closest followers, including the disciples, believed he was going to rise again, and yet that happened. So some theologians suggest that the did, as seen in Matthew, was a more accurate representation, and I I think that definitely does make sense. The point is his capability of performing miracles was not the issue. It was his willingness to perform said miracles in an environment where people denied him. So the same could be said of the Holy Spirit. How the Holy Spirit operates is not a question of capability, rather a matter of willingness where cooperation is lacking. So here are some really significant ways that we can limit the Holy Spirit. Number one, we don't honour the Holy Spirit. Honour is a really big deal in the Bible. When we honour someone or something, we recognise its value. I mean, honour literally means to give someone or something weight, and it's a really big deal to God. We are supposed to honour God first and foremost, and then honour our parents, and we're supposed to honour the elderly. And in 1 Peter 2 verse 17, we are unanimously told to honour everyone. Now, honour doesn't necessarily mean we obey, although in the case of God it does. But were honour to mean obey, at least for myself, there would have been some circumstances where obeying my parents would have been dishonouring to God. You you get my point, right? So let me continue to unpack this point about honour a little bit more by demonstrating what most people believe honour looks like. Number one, listening. Number two, respecting another's power to make decisions and choices. Number three, seeking out and considering the thoughts and opinions of others. Number four, acknowledging someone's presence. Number five, not embarrassing or shaming someone. Number six, taking care with a relationship by valuing it and prioritizing it. And number seven, not looking to the opportunities a person presents as the central purpose of the relationship. So in other words, not using someone. 
Sadly, in my observations, I don't believe we always honor the Holy Spirit. And this is where the extremes in our approach needs to be considered. On the one hand, we have Christian traditions that don't acknowledge that the Holy Spirit exists. I mean, they say that he does, but they don't act like he does. They don't mention the Holy Spirit. They don't think about the Holy Spirit. They presume he is a silent part of the Trinity. Then there is the other opposite extreme where the Holy Spirit is treated like a performing acrobat, an ethereal entertainer that changes my atmosphere to make me feel good. Now, I'm not trying to be negative. I'm just trying to say that we don't always think about how we behave. In some settings, there is such an intense focus on the manifestations of the Holy Spirit that it actually diminishes the value of the Holy Spirit. The focus on the manifestations can actually depersonalize the Holy Spirit and treats the Holy Spirit more like an energy that you might get from a hypnotic drug. Because by focusing on the Holy Spirit's ability to serve me and make me feel a certain way, I have consequently degraded the Holy Spirit to a tool for my pleasure. Now, I know people who can't attend a conference or a church service and deem the event good unless there is some kind of manifestation, as though the Holy Spirit's only purpose and value is in his ability to manifest before us. Like, why are we rating the acts of the Holy Spirit? Why do we have some spiritual hierarchy of what is more or less an act of the Holy Spirit? Why would we think we have the right to judge the acts of the Holy Spirit in such a way? If the Holy Spirit causes you to speak in tongues, it is no more powerful than when he makes you understand a passage of scripture. Get what I'm saying? When the Holy Spirit heals someone physically, it is no more powerful than when he renews someone's mind. The problem with when we get like this is that we downplay the value of everything else the Holy Spirit does. It is not honoring the Holy Spirit if we value one capability and devalue another capability. It is all valuable because it is the Holy Spirit. Let's just put this in perspective for a second. This is the person of the Holy Spirit. They're at the creation of the world equal to all other parts of the Trinity that we didn't have access to prior to Jesus' death and resurrection. It is an honor to receive the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a gift to us. If we aren't careful, we can reduce the Holy Spirit to little more than a spiritual vending machine. See, when we honor the Holy Spirit, we will act accordingly. We will listen. We will respect him as a leader and his attempts to direct and prompt us. We will seek out his opinion and guidance on a matter. We will acknowledge and honor his presence when he does show up and not critique what he does in our conferences and meetings. We won't be embarrassed or ashamed when he does things that are a little bit outside of our comfort zone and might even look a little bit wacky to the outside world. We won't use him. And of course, we will take care with the relationship, valuing and honoring the Holy Spirit by inviting him into our devotional times, our meetings, our homes, our workplaces, and our conversations. We won't only value the Holy Spirit for what we can get out of him. Now, number two, we compartmentalize the traits of the Holy Spirit, which in some ways I've kind of referred to too in the first point. One of the hardest things to grapple with is the fact that the Holy Spirit has these traits that almost seem like they are the opposite. So for instance, the Holy Spirit is described in scripture as a dove, which is meant to display these kind of peaceful qualities. But He is also described as fire that is supposed to relay the power and the refining, purifying nature of the Holy Spirit. It is often hard for us to imagine someone who is both peaceful and passionately wild at the same time, and yet the Holy Spirit is both. The Holy Spirit is so varied in his traits. He is called counselor and yet simultaneously can give us incredible power to cast out heal, and prophesy. The Holy Spirit is called the revealer. He reveals Jesus and the truth to us. The Holy Spirit speaks. He can speak through gentle promptings and wild, vivid dreams and visions like what we see in Revelations. 
But what I see happening often is that we compartmentalize the parts of the Holy Spirit that we have a preference for. In the Pentecostal circles, it is commonplace to focus on the power of the Holy Spirit. In other traditions, it's the gentle whisper and the peaceful qualities of the Holy Spirit. But it is all the Holy Spirit and we ought not to compartmentalize, especially out of preference. Think about it for yourself. If people only ever considered you in this one-dimensional way, would you like it? Let me illustrate this for you by telling you a little bit about my husband. Josh, my husband, is a qualified light vehicle mechanic. He's been working since he was 15 years old and he has worked really hard. He now is the national operations manager for a fairly large company. Now, you don't get to those kinds of levels in a business without having some idea or a good idea about leadership and development. And, you know, he's just a natural at it. He he started the Brisbane team here with just himself and he's grown it to this hugely successful operation with heaps of employees. And, of course, he got promoted to the national operations role about three or four years ago. Now, Josh has never studied leadership. He He hasn't really read many books either. He just has a knack for it. And he's one of those natural born leaders, the quiet, consistent leader, really. So one of the churches we were at used to run these different business leaders events. And sadly, until I sort of brought it to their attention, Josh never used to get invited to them. Now, I don't know if it really upset him, but, you know, I think he would have liked to have contributed. I mean, he's very servant hearted. And I think he, you know, he certainly brought it up with me from time to time. But nobody really gave him the time of day and I knew that a big part of the reason they overlooked him was because they thought he was just a mechanic, as though that is such an ordinary job that everyone can do. And it didn't matter how much they tried to engage him in other ways. It it didn't matter how many spiritual gifts tests they would run him through. They kind of lost him when they put him in a box. So what is the worst part? about having presumed that a mechanic wouldn't know anything about leadership. The issue is that they failed to see his potential and the contribution he could have really made. And how might we be failing to see the potential of the Holy Spirit, of what the Holy Spirit might be able to do in lives, in us and through us, and on this earth, because we've decided he's only about power or because we've decided he's only about peace. I really don't know if the Holy Spirit thinks this way, but why would he show all of himself when he knows that we have the audacity to have preferences with the spirit of the living God? Thankfully, um, he doesn't think like me, so he's probably like, you know, not as negative about it as me. But I still think that it would make a difference if we were to look at him holistically, right? Anyway, I'll move on. Number three, we don't really rely on the spirit. I've got to admit, I haven't exactly understood what that even means. Like, how do you rely on the Spirit? What would you be doing if you were relying on the Spirit of God? Sometimes I find it easier to define what something isn't in order to narrow down what it is. Relying on God is not looking for money to solve your problems. Yeah, I mean, I've done that plenty of times. It's not looking to a person or a relationship or a leader to rescue you from the things you face. It's not looking to your own skills and abilities as your hope for a good life. Relying on God means that we seek him first to know how to respond, how to pivot, how to endure this life. It's not just in the practical solutions that he might be able to give you, but it's also trusting that he will fill your inner needs. Our modern world is very well resourced And there are some things that we never even have to think about, like food. Most of us don't have to think much about where we will get food from. The bigger question is, what food will I eat? And yet there are some believers in other parts of the globe that can't so easily say where they will get their food. Let's just forget about food for a second. We in the modern world generally have homes, water, electricity, blankets, clothes, And for many of those things, we have never had to ask God for it because we can provide it for ourselves. What about healthcare? In Australia, you can rock up to any doctor and charge the bill to Medicare. 
and the doctor will set you on a medical treatment path with medicine, specialists, and whatever else with the intent of curing your ailment. Now, I know it's not a perfect system, but it's way more than many other countries provide. And so for a lot of Australians, we might not have had to ask God to help us with the average health issue. Now, I don't think this is all a big problem. In fact, God can work through all of these means to help heal us. I'm merely saying that we are not geared toward God reliance. Rather, we are geared toward self-reliance. And many Christians go through life making decisions every day, only ever turning to God when they face a hardship that they can't so easily fix themselves. In Revelation 3, the Lord is speaking to the church of Laodicea, and he says this fascinating statement. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Now, most preachers stop there and preach their message about having a passion for God, but let's read on in verse 17. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing. Now, this sounds like a bunch of believers that have decided that they don't need God. Here's the thing. We might believe that God exists and that Jesus came to earth, died on the cross, and rose again for our sins. But if we act in every other way as though we don't need God, we've kind of missed the point. In the case of the church of Laodicea, the fact that they believed they didn't need God because they had wealth was exactly what made them lukewarm and in the end would be the reason they would be spat out of the mouth of God. It's not our perception of our need that determines whether we need God. Every day, people who hate God walk around believing that they don't need him, completely oblivious of the fact that they might only be one wrong decision from being desperately in need of saving. But as believers, our tendency towards self-reliance at the end of the day creates very little room for the Holy Spirit. So let's go a little deeper on the idea of dishonoring the Holy Spirit. Point number one. One of the biggest ways we can dishonor the Holy Spirit is by not listening to him. Now, the first complaint I hear when I raise a point like this is that the Holy Spirit doesn't speak to me, Mel. Now, I genuinely believe that part of the problem here is that we don't teach as much as we could about how we can hear the voice of the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit does speak uniquely to all of us and therefore there is a journey to understanding. The fact is some leaders are really hesitant to teach you about hearing from God at all because obviously many atrocities have occurred because someone said God told me to. So yes, I do get our reservations and we certainly shouldn't ignore the fact that without wisdom such atrocities are possible. But on the flip side of that, Jesus tells us in John 10 verse 27 that his sheep hear his voice. They hear his voice and they follow it. See, the critical thing about hearing the Holy Spirit is that we are still supposed to use wisdom. And the apostles actually demonstrated this in Acts 13, verse 2 to 3. It says, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. What's happening here is the Holy Spirit speaks to the prophets and teachers at Antioch. He tells them to set Barnabas and Saul apart. Now, they didn't just go, yay, well, the Holy Spirit just spoke. Let's go for it, guys. They continued to fast and pray some more, and then they laid hands on them and released them. This is the kind of wisdom that we are meant to have when it comes to hearing from the Holy Spirit. We are currently in the process of moving interstate to Sydney, and I can tell you now that it has been an eight-month process of God giving us dreams, words, opening doors, and much prayer. We didn't just hear God say, move to Sydney and pick up and go. We did the hard and patient task of discernment. Discernment is not popular because it can take time. It requires us to patiently wait out situations that feel like they've had no conclusion. But it is one of the most significant signs of surrender to God. 
when we practically apply Proverbs 3 verse 5, which says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your understanding. So here's the thing. The Holy Spirit speaks in many ways. See, sometimes the problem is that we observe these very vocal prophetic people talking about how they heard the Lord and assume that this is the only way he speaks. We tend to put these prophetic people on a pedestal too, which doesn't really help us. And we assume, well, maybe I'm just not one of those chosen people whom he speaks to. Anyway, this is such a big topic, so I am actually going to dedicate one of the Holy Spirit episodes to hearing from God because I just think it would be irresponsible of me to say, hey, the Holy Spirit does speak and then not actually give you the tools to hear him. The fact is the early church didn't have podcasts or books or anything else. They didn't even really have scripture. Well, at least not the New Testament. Many of the letters and gospels were written decades after the church was actually birthed. They had the Holy Spirit. They were reliant on his voice. Now, that's not to say that the Holy Spirit doesn't work through these resources that we have today. It's just to say that the Holy Spirit is first and foremost our guide. You guys have heard me mention before how I went through a severe eating phobia last year for like 10 weeks. One of the things I did when I went through this was that I waited for the Holy Spirit to guide me and tell me, how I needed to walk out the journey. It was hard and I did have to be patient. I was up and down emotionally, but the path the Holy Spirit led me on was right and I will never regret it. Okay, so here's the big point. We haven't seen yet what the Holy Spirit is capable of and I'm not just talking about the big moves of the Holy Spirit and I'm not just talking about the feeling of his presence or his healing words either. I'm talking about all of it. The Holy Spirit is our hope for everything in this life. We cannot live this faith journey without the Spirit. That's why it was so critical to the gospel that we receive this Spirit. It was an essential part of the new covenant. We are a new creation in Christ, but we haven't got much chance of staying alive in this newness of life without the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit is our hope in resisting sin and living a faithful life. Galatians 5.16 says, But I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. He doesn't say that when you walk by the Spirit, there's a better chance of resisting the desires of the flesh. It says you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. We're often trying in our own strength to resist sin. But here we are told that resisting temptation is a direct result of relying on the Spirit, hearing the Spirit, and responding to the Spirit's prompts. The Holy Spirit is our hope of experiencing God's love. Romans 5 verse 5 says, And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. This couldn't be clearer. God's love is poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the main vehicle for experiencing that love. The Holy Spirit is our hope of freedom. Romans 8 verse 2 says, For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. And 2 Corinthians 3.17 says, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Freedom is a given when the Spirit of the Lord is present and active. Not only does the Spirit give us freedom from the law of sin and death, but his goal is to continue leading us to a greater freedom in Christ. The Holy Spirit is our hope for revelation. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 10 says, These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. The ongoing growing revelation of Christ in us is wholly and solely dependent on the Spirit of God revealing Christ to us. This is huge. It means that there is no sermon, no message, no podcast or book that is able to reveal Christ to us without the active living Holy Spirit. 
The Holy Spirit is our hope for unity. Ephesians 4 verse 1 to 3 says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Everything that we have been promised in Christ is enabled through the Spirit of God living in us. This is our hope. In the next episode, we are going to keep talking about the Holy Spirit, but a very specific aspect. We are going to talk about the anointing. But before I close, I want to tell you one more story out of Acts. When you've been a Christian for a while, you kind of take it for granted that Jesus healed. Jesus was divine, so it isn't so shocking in some ways that he was able to raise people from the dead. I mean, I'm not saying it's good that we feel that way, but it just happens to be that way when you've been a Christian for a long time. But in Acts 9 from verse 36, Peter raises a woman to life. Tabitha had died, and verse 40 tells us that Peter walked into her room, knelt down, and prayed. He looked at her and said, Tabitha, arise, and she was completely resurrected. I don't know if there is any greater miracle than someone being brought back to life. I mean, dead is dead. But the Holy Spirit operating in Peter enabled him to raise a woman from the dead. You might be like me, who has read the incredible acts that Jesus performed and thought, yeah, but he's Jesus. But with Peter, no such excuse can be given. He was just like us. It's the same Holy Spirit working in him. And it is the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead, living in you too, as Romans 6 tells us. The Apostle Paul's message to the Thessalonian church is still so relevant today as it was those hundreds of years ago when he wrote it. And we ought to take this instruction seriously, as though our communities and societies depend on it, because they do. Do not quench the spirit. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Pink Elephant. You can follow me on Instagram, Facebook, or you can check out my resources on my website, meljsayward.com.